Assalamu alaikum, Mom Tom. Wa alaikum salam, Rasulullah. Salam. 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 Like we haven't been spending the last week or whatever together, but yep. uh, alhamdulillah, just had the news. Biden, yeah. Despite being a, you know, just a few days ago, a youthful firebrand, he's finally, he's finally. Get out of the president. Get out of the presidential race. I went off my commiserations. I know you must be so. Upset. Absolutely devastated. Yeah. So now the abandoned Biden campaign is probably finished, is completed. Now you can all throw your support behind Kamala Harris, right? <laughs> No, this is actually both um, a tremendous challenge and a tremendous opportunity. What's happened now with the unfolding sort of presidential election. What is promising is that there's no doubt that the agitation and the organization around uh, the issue of Palestine and Biden's support and active participation in the genocide has been a major factor in him stepping down. Don't let anybody fool you. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, it's true. He really flopped at the debate, yes, but he's been mentally like this for quite some time, and it wasn't a problem until recently. You know, so this is a, it's a, an accumulation of forces, right? And if you look at, let's say, there's one straw that breaks the camel's back, let's say that there's a hundred straws on top of that camel, right? Many of those straws are Gaza and Palestine and what's been going on. So it is something of a victory in the sense that we have, we have agitated enough uh, on Palestine where, okay, you know, we haven't been able to actually stop the genocide, unfortunately. However, we have caused a shift in the political landscape by contributing to the factors that caused Biden to step down. Now, what's uniquely challenging about that is that now, well, it's a challenge and an opportunity, as I said, now the Democratic Party is maneuvering to back Kamala Harris who is just as bad, every bit as bad as Biden on Palestine. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Mm -hmm. And so we now have the opportunity that's here is to really make this election a referendum on Palestine, mm -hmm. right? Because if we run back to, if Muslims throw their support behind Kamala Harris, it will send the message that um, really or let's say the narrative that the media will take away from that was that it really was about Biden's mental acuity. It really was about his memory. He wasn't fit off this. Palestine wasn't as significant, right? It will be able, the media is already trying to do this, right? It's already trying to spin the narrative that this is mostly about Biden's ability to win and it's mostly about his, um, you know, his, his mental sort of presence or lack thereof. Um, that by eliminating those factors. Now we have, we're likely going to have Harris as the, nom as the nominee and the Democratic Party living up to its name as the undemocratic party is doing every dirty trick in the book to make sure that Harris gets the nomination in the party. And they're trying to not let it go to an open convention that would, you know, allow some competition. I'm on WhatsApp groups with delegates within the Democratic Party. I just spy. I'm just a lurker where I they literally doing things that people are considering suing the Democratic Party. They're they're every dirty, rotten trick in the book. They are pulling to attempt to make this a non contest. So there's still a chance that someone else might run. There is a chance. It will depend on what happens at the convention. Um, there are when's that uh, August in August. So, so it's upcoming. Um, but it looks like an outside shot. It looks like the Democratic Party is going to, they've quickly moved to try to throw their support behind Harris. They are trying to downplay Palestine, though both sides recognize the reason, and this is another win for the Muslims, both sides recognize the win, excuse me, the need to give lip service to the Palestinian cause. Why would Donald Trump release on the same week that he's about to meet with Netanyahu? Why would he release the letter that Mahmoud Abbas sent to him. And obviously Abbas is a very problematic figure, right? He's basically a sellout of Palestine, but he releases the get well soon card <laughs> that Mahmoud Abbas sends to Trump. Why would he do that? He would not do that if he didn't want to pander just a little bit to the people who are supporting Palestine in order so he can play both sides. Why would Kamala Harris not show up or schedule to be elsewhere at the same time when Netanyahu is going to be addressing Congress? right? While still having a private meeting with him. They're she she wouldn't do that. And eat They're it. very much trying to have their cake and eat it too. And some people, you know, the, the lesson to take away from this is not just that politicians are horrible people and they're hypocrites, which is true. The lesson to take away from this is that they wouldn't be doing that if there wasn't serious power and they're being really afraid. Even that, look at Netanyahu and look at his actions. The fact that he's coming all the way to the U.S. The fact that many of the congressmen 
uh, decided not to show up. And not all of them were Democrats. Some of them were Republicans as well. The fact that there was... Um, that he got 50 something standing ovations though. He did. That's true. And that's the narrative that he will spin. And just like yeah. AIPAC tries to make up funny numbers about we're undefeated in elections, not true. AIPAC had significant losses this, and they're much more hemmed in than they've ever been. There's so much more attention on them. So you have to understand, like, performativity. it's all trying to portray a certain narrative that their victory is inevitable. Trying and to create it's, the narrative. It's a, exactly. Yeah. They're trying to manifest it. They're trying to speak it into being. Yeah. So you can't take them at face value. Netanyahu is panicking. Right. That's why he's coming. That's why uh, Ben Gavir, I think it was, that announced his sort of like endorsement of Trump. Netanyahu, uh, you know, scheduled this meeting with Trump and other things that he's been doing. He, I think he, he, he made some overtures because he's afraid of what Trump is going to do. Don't let anybody. He said out loud that we're I think we want Trump as a, as a president. He's very calculated. He knows what this is going to do within the US political space. He knows that it's going to create the situation where you know, people are now going to throw um, you know, the fear mongering of a Trump presidency, which there are very, very serious you know, threats, um, but that they're going to leverage that to push people back to Democrats um, who have been you know, in some ways, well, let, let's just be very explicit. They have been the executors of the genocide. As Rifat al arir said in his last tweet before he was uh, martyred, that don't get it twisted not his words, my words, that the people responsible for the genocide are Biden and the Democratic Party. Anyway, all this is saying that they are scared. The politicians are scared. The pro-Palestinian activism has done something serious. The, the issues, the Overton window has shifted. The things that we're allowed to talk about now in public were not allowed to be talked about up until, up until now. The level of criticism being leveled at Israel right now is unprecedented. The level of um, being willing to reassess the relationship with Israel. Like, yes, we see that right now there's still a, uh, a united front in Congress about supporting or whatever, but it's cracking. Like, it's cracking now's in ways. Now's the time to throw in the towel. Not at all. Now's the time to actually, and this is what the Muslim sellouts who want to run back to Harris don't see, that this is when you press on the gas. This is when you actually push further. They are in retreats. They are backpedaling. That's not when you, some of the people I've seen, you know, say like, well, now you know, Trump is such a threat to democracy. We have to support Harris and we need to get ironclad agreements from her or ironclad promises from her or ironclad concessions from her. You can't get ironclad concessions or promises from a Zionist. Like that's not how it works. So, you know, this is very stupid. It's very naive. It's exactly the type well, of- And fact, if you, want, if you want influence, you have to pose some kind of credible threat. Exactly, to... exactly. Yeah. So we, we and I was just arguing today, we're here at the museum in uh, Kuala Lumpur. I was on my phone arguing with people in WhatsApp chats, exactly proving this point is that you have to be able to deliver a credible threat if you want to influence people in power. It's not yeah. about likability. It is, politics is not about likability. It's not that let's ingratiate ourselves to Harris and maybe then she'll give us something on Palestine. That is not how it works. You ingratiate yourself to somebody. It's humiliation. They take you for granted. They say, oh, I've got these Muslims. They're not going to go to Trump. They're afraid of Trump. And then they will do nothing for you. You have aborted your leverage. You've given it all up. We have leverage, but we have to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. Now is not the time to let it go and say, okay, well, now we're going to go with Harris. Maybe she'll be better on Palestine. She'll be just as bad. Now we hold on to our leverage. We say, no, abandon Harris too and abandon anybody else who's going to do it. Trump has, will, will pay attention as well. Even if he wins, he will pay attention to that. And then it will continue to change what's possible within the political landscape. Well, is there a possibility that somebody you know, uh, else gets chosen as a democratic candidate who's, who's materially different? Here's how things work. It, you push things so hard that the establishment will try to give you the least bad option for itself. OK, and then it will continue to give you lesser, slightly lesser bad options, slightly lesser bad. So their first move is Harris, because Harris is essentially Biden 2.0. She's a younger, more identity politic, you know, politically correct version of Biden. OK, mm. if we continue to press our advantage, it, the Democratic Party is stupid enough to still go with Harris and, and lose the election, which they will. If they go with Harris, they will lose the election. But let's say in, a, in, a, in a, some sort of scenario, they decide, oh, wow, like these Muslims aren't playing around. Like they really are abandoning the Democrats. Like it will cause us to lose. Let's say then they'll probably go with someone like a Gavin Newsom, somebody who is a like incrementally less bad, like or at least pretends to be less bad. Right. And then if you keep pushing, they'll offer someone else and you keep pushing and they'll offer somebody else. But that's the thing is that there's not going to be. How do you get a materially better situation for the Muslims? That's the open ended question. Well, materially not worse. 
Yeah, materially not worse. And that is by not giving up your leverage. And the, the, the thing right now is to make sure that the Democrats lose. I don't see them going to somebody who's substantively better to the point where we would actually vote for them. Mm. And even if they did, you know, there's the question of, yeah, they need to be punished, right? Punish Democrats. Yeah, no, it is. It's a punish labor, punish Democrats sort of thing. Why? Are we just spiteful? Are we not like concerned about the, the concerns that Trump raises? Trump's a threat to democracy. Look, Biden's a threat to democracy too, right? People forget this, that, you know, the things that, Jam that Trump does, the, the, thing, the, the things that Trump does out loud, Biden and Obama do secretly, wow. right? Like very much so. Uh, and people who don't pay attention to that, you know, uh, you need to pay attention to that. That Obama's the one who droned U.S. citizens abroad, yeah. right? Like Obama's the one who started CVE, right? That this is not, um, and this is not in praise of Trump whatsoever, but there's a difference here. That Biden and the Democratic Party right now are committed to Zionism, okay? How do you go about getting them to rethink that commitment? I mean, it's amazing that he would rather sacrifice or step down, sacrifice his own second term, potentially. He'd rather do that than come out against a genocide. Right. Well, he's, he's again, he's a committed Zionist and he knows he doesn't believe in Muslim political power right now. And you couldn't blame him for that because we haven't demonstrated that we can do it, which is actually why we need to punish and make sure the Democrats lose, even if it means Trump winning. Right. Not because we like Trump not because we think that we're actually better allies of the right or anything like that, but just for the fact that we need to send a political message, we need to make supporting Zionism and supporting the genocide of Muslims so politically costly that everybody knows that this is a red line. If you cross it, you will lose the next election. Doesn't matter if you're Republican, doesn't matter if you're Democrat, doesn't matter if you're up ballot, down ballot. But Trump's a Zionist too, no? He's not in the same way that Biden is. Like if Trump is an opportunist, he's a chameleon, he only believes in himself. And we've so seen that. Trump, Trump or Harris, which is going to be worse for, or better for, or less bad for Muslims in the US well, and we, around the world? Well, we don't have a crystal ball. You know, we can't say that concretely. But let's say that when it comes to the opportunities to, sh to, to influence them, you have to say that somebody who's an opportunist, it, you, you might have more opportunities to influence them than somebody who's ideologically committed to something. Uh, okay. Harris's, you know, uh, husband is uh, as a Zionist. You know, like she's, uh, you know, look at her, her APAC contributions, look at her speeches, her groveling speeches to APAC, right? It's like, she's very committed to this thing. Trump is a mixed bag, like he is on everything. Sometimes he says things and you're like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Like how he said that Netanyahu is not a good faith actor. And that's why Netanyahu is a little bit afraid of Trump and why he's trying to patch that up right now. That, you know, he has said that the perception that the United States is not a neutral arbiter in Palestine, Israel, prevents it from being a, um, a, basically a source of arbitration. You can't be an arbiter if you're skewed towards one side. He said that. It was now in, he received so much backlash from saying that, that then he felt like he needed to pander. And so then he moved the embassy to, to Jerusalem, right? But the thing is that Trump is a loose cannon, okay? He's someone who only believes in his own survival. And so you can create a situation with him, mm. though it takes work. So we might not be able, whether we do that work or not is a different question, but you could create a situation on which Trump says, you know what, it's not worth it to support Netanyahu or to support, you know, this or whatever, um, you know, depending on, uh, depending on the circumstance. Whereas I see that as much less likely with Harris. Now, that being said, you know, Trump, Trump poses unique challenges that Harris doesn't. OK, this is not like to rehabilitate Trump as a, as a political actor, that he's somehow beneficial to Muslims. It will be hard. But we've survived four years of Trump um, back when it was harder and less favorable. Right. And now Muslim political power is on the rise. And so another four years of Trump, we can't assume that it's going to be exactly the same. Even the right, even the political right is not exactly the same as it was in 2016. Mm. We have people that are slowly starting to question and reevaluate the United States relationship with Israel, the people up and people, you know, they, they do what you want. Sorry if it triggers you, but the Candace Owens's of the world, the Tucker Carlson's of the world, like yeah. there's a thawing. And that's something that we don't benefit. And I've talked about this elsewhere. You know, we won't talk about it here, but Muslims don't benefit themselves at all from jumping into the left or the right. Like yeah. we need to actually play the middle and play both sides in a way that's strategic to ourselves.
So is there, is, there, is there no way, like in the UK, where there's the possibility for a space for independence to emerge? Not yet, no because our election laws are very draconian, and they've been, <laughs> our election laws have been written by the Democratic and Republican parties, so you can imagine they really disfavor third parties. In fact, in just the last couple of years, um, those election laws have gotten even harder on third parties. So that means that getting into a televised debate, right, getting on the ballot in certain states, this is something that's extremely hard for a third party to do. We as Muslims have a vested interest in creating a situation where that's less hard to do, which brings up the possibility of voting third party or, or whatever, right? But the point is that right now, it's not, it's not going to get someone elected, okay? You can't run as an independent for a presidential, you can't run as a Green Party. Like what you can't anyone literally. else for in other, any, any other um, positions of influence like maybe mayors or local yes or... locally absolutely and and locally like we have seen success and that's why you know muslims have to pay attention to the grassroots nature of building political power it's a mistake to throw up some sort of savior to congress at the federal level and think that they're going to when you don't have any power base underneath of them yeah. you've basically just taken someone from your own community perhaps in the best case scenario and handed them over to the democratic party now they're responsible to the Democratic Are Party. subject to all the forces that exist yeah, there. Yeah, they, the they don't have any leverage to not be, mm. right? Like they don't have any funding outside. The Democratic Party pays for their campaign, right? Mm. The, the Democratic Party sets their agenda. So what are they going to do, right? So the long-term solution, yes, there needs to be a, a, a grassroots power building from the bottom up, whether it's school boards, city councils, you know, mayors, and then state legislatures as well, you know, state Supreme Courts, like the, their state, you know, governance as well. Mm. And then that it is going to create the base and the cover to protect a federal sort of level political intervention from, from Muslims. Mm. So what does, um, what does Biden's dropout mean for Trump? Um, I think it still plays in his hands. I think that he would have had, an, in some sense, he would have an easier time beating Biden. Like he ran around, ran around him in circles when it came to the debate. Um, Trump is, relies on insult and personal insult and and there's certain advantages like biden is so obviously bad that it, it's really you know um that trump would have a field day harris is still very bad like she's very lukewarm milk toast she doesn't have a strong personality record. she's a very bad track record when it comes to the african-american community and criminalization and like uh and sort of policing or over policing she has she's just not a strong personality so he will he will poach upon that uh she has she has tried to leverage her identity politics, you know, uh, for her, but honestly, it doesn't come off as authentic. She comes off as very fake, mm -hmm. right, um, and very sort of opportunistic, and not really having strong much of anything. So he will still be very successful discursively against her in a debate or something like that. Um, so, uh, but the other aspect is basically the um, the disarray that the Democratic Party is in. This is the only time this has happened. This has never happened in history. Right. There was an example in the 60s of Lyndon Johnson not running again on the same ticket, even though he was incumbent. But he stepped down in May. Right. This is so late in the game. The Democratic Convention is next month. It's not even settled yet. Is it going to be Harris or is it going to be an open convention? The Democratic Party is definitely in disarray. It's chaos. And any of that benefits Trump. That's why actually Trump has been very sort of almost hands off letting the Democrats hang themselves, so to speak, <laughs> because they're so, they're so spiteful towards popular will, despite their name, and also, um, you know, just sort of malevolent, conniving, <laughs> uh, a malevolent, conniving political force. He almost doesn't have to do anything. Yeah. Like, I almost think that Trump, if he just keeps on just keep posting, your mouth keep your mouth up, avoid any, like, major gaps, yeah, yeah. and he'll win, right? he'll probably have other opportunities to capitalize on mistakes that the Democratic Party will continue to make. So imagine if, if Trump wins, what's the plan then? What do you foresee for Muslims to take the, the campaign to the next level for Muslim empowerment? Uh, political... Yes, there's a couple things. One thing people are talking about, or people are talking about obstruction, right? And I think that there is reason to, there, there, that, that has a point. What does that mean? Um, obstruction means that basically you want to create a scenario in which, yes, Trump is the president, but he is undermined and made ineffective by the makeup of the House and the okay. makeup of the senators. So if you have a very mixed Congress that's, you know, uh, even that has, you know, a strong Democratic presence, he won't have a rubber stamp from Congress for whatever he wants to do. That's one school of thought. I think that that has merit. I think that there is uh, room for a strategy of obstruction. Um, I think that something else that has to happen is that Muslims, again, need to get over their fear of engaging the Thomas Masseys of the world 
Uh, Thomas Massey is a Republican congressman from Kentucky, and he is somebody who is principled enough that AIPAC tried to, to primary him, right? He's very critical of Israel and AIPAC. Well, some people say he's not critical of Israel, but he's critical of U U.S. military aid going to Israel in the way it is. Yeah. So there's something of a Rawlsian consensus where he doesn't support our issues in, for the same reasons that we would support our issues, but his isolationism, his America first, whatever, his, you know, sort of um, against money and politics sort of things puts him in the crosshairs of Israel and AIPAC, right? Now, what did the, when he was getting primaried by AIPAC, meaning that AIPAC was going to run someone against him in his own Republican primary election to try to replace him, what did the Muslim community do for him? Zero. Nothing. Right. I mean, do they have the ability to do anything for him anyway? Are they do, they, even if it's a fun. Look at what the Muslims are doing for people like in the progressive branch of the Democratic Party, such as the, the Ilhan Omars and the Cory Bushes and the Jamal Bowmans. It was all hands on deck. Let's throw fundraisers. Let's like get out the vote. Let's do canvassing. Right. You don't have any of any of that. And I understand that it won't be the same energy. Right. But I think that it's a strategic mistake to not do any of that. Because again, I think that those types of Republicans, those types of conservatives that are not, I, I was in a WhatsApp group and this was brought up. And you know what so one Muslim said in response? They said, oh, but he's pro-gun. <laughs> As if that so were- So am I now after my one visit to Texas. Yeah, so are you, right? <laughs> so am I, I'm pro-gun, right? It's like, I have, I have guns. You know, it's like, like th this is not like, so this no, is- this not talking about uh, this. No, I, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> but this is a strategic failure, right? That's a strategic, a failure to think strategically is that, you know, gun issues, um, first of all, the Muslim community is not of one voice on that. Second of all, it is not a priority when compared to Palestine, right? And so mm -hmm. if you have someone who, it, we, now it's true that we have to articulate our issues and our priorities because there's other issues where now things maybe oh, are more complicated, mm -hmm. but that's a, a very, very simple. Don't be simplistic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Nobody's going to be perfect. You can't dismiss mm -hmm. better for an ideal, right? You don't so, let per perfect be the enemy of good, yeah. right? So. We could have done something. Be pragmatic, yeah. Pragmatic. It would have perhaps changed the calculus. What, and this is, okay, so this is the example so I give the Muslims. Not, uh, did he not win then? No, he won. Okay. Despite the Muslims doing nothing for him, he won. And this is why I say, you know, a lot of Muslims, they say, we need a Muslim APAC. I said, okay. But you don't realize what the strategy of APAC is. It's not just about APAC throwing money into politics, though that's part of it. APAC knows that it has natural support from the right, from the neocons and from the evangelical right. They know that their support is not automatic on the left. And so that's where they put their money, right? To their enemies. To their enemies. Central enemies. Keep your enemy closer. Yeah. yeah, keep your friend closer, enemy closer. If a Muslim version of APAC would exist, where would we put our money? I mean, wherever you put it, you probably get accusations of being you would, a sellout. But or... this is why we're not thinking strategically. Yeah. We're thinking very, very naively, to be frank. It's like, there are people on the left that will support Palestine, whether we support them or not, because that's their politics, their progressive politics or justice Democrats or whatever. There are several different sort of camps in the left, okay? Don't we have a vested interest in developing mm. and assisting even those elements on the right that are in our favor? That would truly be analogous to doing what AIPAC does. But you can't even have that conversation amongst Muslims without being accused of being a fascist or not understand, I don't know, like whatever their excuses are. So that's the thing, we, we have opportunity. I think that these dynamics and those dynamics especially would change the character of a four years of Trump. Yeah. And that's not to say that it's going to be Pax Americana and we're going to be having a great time. But if you have Republicans in Congress, let's say, that were supported by Muslims because they were primaried by AIPAC, then Trump tries to do something against Muslims, which he will at some point. What do you think is going to happen in Congress? Mm. Right? We're missing opportunities here. We're so obstruction is one. Obstruction is one. And then sort of cultivating, again, in a non-ideologically limited way, mm. cultivating on both sides people who are willing to act within our interests. Uh -huh. you know? what, what should Muslims in the U.S. and elsewhere do to utilize the shift in, uh, or the, the tremors in the Everton window? I think one thing that's very important, and this is again uh, something that we were talking about, not getting pigeonholed into the left or the right. Mm. If, the, if the issue of Palestine or Muslim issues, the right stops any solidarity with Muslims by portraying us as part of the left, mm -hmm. right? 
we're part of the woke crowd, we're part of Antifa, we're part of, you know, the, the coalition of minorities that's going to come and replace like their way of life. As long as we're construed as that, it's a, the major obstacle to the right having solidarity with, with anybody who's Muslim or, or, or Muslim issues, right? This is the strategic weakness in allowing ourselves to get sucked into just being a prop for the left. And right now the Muslims, make no mistake, are a prop for the left. The left have not, look at the camera, the left have not delivered for the Muslims. They have not delivered anything for the Muslims other than rhetoric and symbolic victories. All the queers for Palestine or the whatever progressives, they have done nothing tangible to stop the genocide. They've done nothing tangible to stop. Some people have come out in support, but they have not delivered anything. And so why should we be beholden to whatever they say our allies should be, or whoever they say we should be talking to, or whoever they say we should be working, when what's our ROI? Our ROI on that political relationship is very low. It's not zero, but it's very low, right? So, you know, we have to be very careful to not allow ourselves to get sucked into the culture wars of left versus right, of globalist versus nationalist. We actually, our issues transcend that and our platform transcends that. And we have to be able to keep that ground in order to be taken seriously by either side and in order to have enough sort of strategic leverage that we can actually get wins, that we can actually get results and not just promises. So what's your kind of final message to the Muslims uh, back home then? The final message to the Muslims is to wake up and grow up and understand better how pol politics and power works. Politics is not about being liked. That's one of our fundamental mistakes. We mm -hmm. act as if, if we're liked by someone, then they'll protect us. This is slave mentality. This mm -hmm. is inferior, inferiority complex, is colonized mentality. That's not how pol politics and power works. You have to be able to deliver a credible threat or to be able to deliver something that the other side needs. That's how power works. Mm -hmm. And until we organize ourselves in order so that we can actually do those things, we will continue to be just a prop, whether it's a prop of the right or, the prop, or a prop of the left. We can be propped by anybody, right? Um, so we need to seriously think about power and building power and the slow sort of long march of doing it in a grassroots way and not taking shortcuts and not thinking that we're going to be able to just, you know, throw up our hands, oh, we're just a minority. Or, you know, that, none of that is relevant. Absolutely none of that is relevant. Mm -hmm. But we have to be sober about how political power works. We should be studying this thing, right? Uh, not even necessarily. We do need to be, we need to be organized, not united. And why I say that is because people use unity to stop you from doing good things. They'll always bring up, oh, you're being divisive. Oh, you know, we need to, we don't need this disunity now. People have been using this to attempt to stop accountability because there's a whole uh, cadre of sellouts and people who have not act, acted principally, right? Um, and when you start to challenge them, they say, well, brother, brother, we need unity. We don't need unity with everybody. I don't need unity with you. If you're going to sell out Palestine, I do not need unity with you, mm -hmm. right? So what type of unity do we, are we talking about? I would prefer the term, we need organization. We mm -hmm. need to organize our message, articulate what are our priorities, what are our issues, how do they interact with other issues? Like what's our main three issues and then a, another tier and then another tier. We need to organize our money. We need to start saying to, to mosques how much people should be giving in charity, sadaqah, every year to politics. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we need to organize our people so that we understand that um, we know who we have in this health care industry or in this sector or in that sector. Mm -hmm. We need to organize our ability to act so that if we had, um, if we wanted to do something where we organized 15,000 people tomorrow, what would it, let's reverse it, what would it take to be yeah. able to say, we want to do, we decide in 24 hours, we want 15,000 of our people to do this one thing at the same time, even if it's just like scratching their head at the same time. Work Re backwards. Reverse engineer. What would it take to get to that point? Okay. Um, the same thing with money. Let's say if we, if we were able to raise a million dollars in 24 hours, then we could liberate Palestine. Occupation gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. What reverse engineer that? What would it take to develop the infrastructure, mm -hmm. the political infrastructure, the community infrastructure to get to that point? Once we've done that, then we actually have power. Then you can say, okay, on October 5th, every single Muslim healthcare worker in the country is gonna walk out of the job and they will be terrified. They'll be shaking in their boots. They'll be, the politicians will be calling you. They'll be calling the mosque, talking to the imam, please, please don't do this, please, what can we do? What can we do? That's what political power looks like, right? But we have to organize in order to get there. Mm -hmm. So organize and it's better to be feared than loved. In a word, yes. Yeah.
Uh, by Better to be feared than liked. Yeah, and liked. And Zakma Khaira to you at home for watching. If you like this podcast, as usual, give a like and a share and subscribe, whatever you're hearing this or watching this. Uh, let us know in the comments uh, any you know, thoughts you have. Agree, disagree. And if you don't like this podcast, See. click the thumbs down <laughs> button twice. Yeah, then uh, we'll really get the message, inshallah. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Click it twice, that's gold, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's bounce.